everyone, and thank you for being here with us today. If we aren't careful, the trade and investment negotiations ongoing now between the United States and Europe could undermine a great many public, sensitive public interests we care about and that I'm sure your members here in Congress care about, including how we regulate financial services, including food safety, including health care, including access to knowledge information, even your privacy online and what the IT companies do with your personal data. All of this is in play in the TTIP uh, negotiations. Why and how this, this works, for those who might not be as familiar with free trade agreements, they're no longer just about tariffs. Tariffs in this negotiation is a very small part of the negotiation. Tariffs between the United States and Europe are, are uh, uh, tariff barriers are, are quite low. This is mostly an agreement about regulation and deregulation. It's a 20 to 30 year long project with the Transatlantic Business Council and corporate interests on both sides of the Atlantic that have been looking for a path to dismantle regulations that does not require going through the European Parliament or the US Congress, at least with the typical attendant scrutiny. These agreements include provisions that say at the outset that uh, the parties shall ensure compliance of all domestic laws with the provisions of this agreement. So that's the mechanism. There are a great many chapters, chapters on intellectual property, regulatory coherence, financial services, investment, environment, etc. And anything that's written in any of those chapters, the US and the EU will have to ensure uh, that they, that they change their laws or regulations so as to comply. If they don't, they're subject to dispute settlement with the other party and also to this mechanism called investor state that was referenced in the first panel, meaning corporations will have the right to sue the United States or state municipal governments in private international tribunals not subject to the U.S. court system operating under trade, uh, trade and investment rules as remarkable as it may sound. For example, right now, Eli Lilly is suing Canada for $500 million uh, for its perfectly uh, international rule compliant patent laws because Eli Lilly doesn't like the result. And this agreement, if, if investor state is included, will subject the United States, will subject us, will subject our European counterparts, uh, counterparts to a great many more uh, possible similar actions. So we're not only surrendering our ability to regulate in a number of areas, areas, but also the sovereignty of our court system with potentially very large financial uh, consequences. So that's a bit on, on how, these, how these agreements work. Um, I work at Public Citizen. I run a global access to medicines program. We're principally focused with access to medicines in developing countries and confronting the problem of global pharmaceutical monopoly power. Um, and, but in the context of this agreement, not, we actually do have developing country interests at stake and also consumers in both the United States and European Union, as my colleagues have articulated, uh, face very significant threats to our, to our health care systems. Uh, the issue that we principally work on is patents and competition. Generic competition is the most effective way to bring medicine prices down, ensure they continue to fall over time. And big pharma, pharmaceutical industry, bio, work very hard to ensure that they have the longest, broadest, strongest monopoly protection uh, under the rules of the United States and European Union and everywhere else. And their principal mechanism for getting the rules they want in other countries over the past 20 years has been free trade agreements by packing the intellectual property chapter and other chapters with the sort of rules that they want to see. So in this agreement, it's a little bit different than the typically asymmetrical uh, US negotiation with a small Central American country, for example. Two very large, powerful players, but both players have large and powerful pharmaceutical industries. And our systems work a little bit differently. And the industry is making very strong demands of our trade representative and of members of Congress to include some very bad rules. And if they get what they want, as they very frequently do, which means if members of Congress don't stand up and ask some tough questions at the outset, we could be in a situation where consumers on both sides of the Atlantic are paying more money for medicines, are limiting competition, restricting our access to information about regulated, potentially dangerous regulated products, and giving up uh, our sovereignty with regard to this investor state dispute settlement at the same time. 
So specifically, there are four major industry asks in TTIP. The first one has to do with price, uh, pharmaceutical pricing and reimbursement, and it's one of the major concerns that AARP has raised. In past agreements, we've seen a series of provisions that are designed to attack other countries' programs analogous to our Medicare and Medicaid. And there's a very significant danger that those same provisions could reach back through to the United States and be used to limit our own use of reimbursement programs and the independence of those agencies and their ability to work with reimbursement rates. Companies want uh, rights of independent appeal. They want to be able to participate in the decision-making uh, process, actually have a seat at the table in ways that would actually violate our own conflict of interest rules in many cases in both state and federal programs. Uh, there's a very there's a there's a desire to attack uh, medicine pricing policies that are going on in Greece and Spain and elsewhere right now, particularly since the financial crisis. But this can come back, uh, come back and, and and bite Americans, particularly again with regard to this idea that if there are provisions on this in TTIP, and the corporations find that they're not getting what they want from a state or a federal reimbursement program, they may be able to sue us under investor state outside our court system and demand a heck of a lot of money uh, from our programs in an effort to change our policies and raise our health care costs. Second is the clinical trial data disclosure issue that's been mentioned. We really don't know that much about the pharmaceuticals that we take. Companies are required to provide dossiers to the Food and Drug Administration, but they are not required to publish anything. And the FDA does what it can with oversight, but it misses a lot. And there have been a series of examples in recent years where we've seen how important access to that information for independent researchers, researchers can be to protect the public. Um, uh, and so I mentioned a couple of examples. We stockpiled Tamiflu at a, a taxpayer cost of billions of dollars. Turns out to be no more effective than aspirin. Uh, that's revealed through ongoing research. There was uh, a, a spinal treatment by, by Medtronic, uh, well, a back pain treatment by Medtronic. It was a biomaterial engi engineer for the spine that proved to be no more effective than the alternatives on the market. The deaths from Vioxx. Uh, a series of a series of other cases we can look at where independent researchers have shown that something on the market was either unsafe or ineffective. Our own health research group at Public Citizen works very hard to get more information about these products and is often turned down, or at least certain components of the information they need, because of these commercial confidential confidentiality provisions. And the companies have made very clear in their submissions to the U.S. Trade Representative, right? So how this works, you've got six or seven hundred corporate advisors to the trade policy making process and they put in their comments and many of their comments are typically taken. We've seen over the last 20 years that USTR gives great deference to the industry requests and in these comments they're, they're from bio, from pharma, from the US Chamber of Commerce, a series of references to clinical trial data and a, de a desire to clamp down on progress we're making and access th to that information via trade secret rules, confidential business information rules, and regulatory coherence rules. And we can share the details with anyone, anyone that's curious. But <coughs> Europe is making real progress in this area in the past few years, and we badly need to follow that example. And if the companies succeed in undermining Europe's access to information progress, which just doesn't just affect pharmaceuticals, by the way, but also chemicals, we'll be in a very bad, uh, very bad position here, here at home. Uh, Third, harmonization of the intellectual property regimes. So both, uh, both regions have rules that have been designed in no small part by the pharmaceutical industry already to protect their monopoly power. But as I said, they work in slightly different ways. And it's quite possible through a secretive process such as this that we wind up with the worst of both sets of rules. So that could mean uh, on this side of the Atlantic, for example, that we wind up with a longer automatic monopoly period for conventional pharmaceuticals under the EU data market exclusivity rules that, uh, that last for 11 years. Europe, meanwhile, could wind up with our rules on biologics, new rule under, 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 the, uh, under Obamacare that would extend the monopolies on new cancer drugs and so on. So it could be, very much could be, a bad deal all around. Uh, just a, a little piece on, on evergreening and biologics, which uh, biologics are larger, are many of the new medicines now, many of the new cancer drugs and so on um, that Lee mentioned. Um, so evergreening is effectively a form of patent abuse and many of those, those terms are often included, included in, in a, we've seen them in many past FTAs. The biologics bit is under, under the Affordable Care Act, we 
we sort of, we sort of lost that battle in Congress where we wound up with a much longer period of automatic monopoly for new cancer drugs than we would like. And that means that treatments that could have come affordable for, for many Americans and less of a burden on our system within five years, instead are, it's going to take 12 or more. Now, the Obama administration has proposed cutting that period back to seven years. And that has support from some congressional leaders. We would like to see that period change. If you sign in a 12-year period into this trade agreement, Congress won't be able to change the rule anymore at least not without dispute settlement with the European Union and probably getting sued up and down by all the corporations under investor state. That's the sort of thing that's at stake here. We like your members, like like your senators and representatives to be able to make the rules that they see are appropriate for healthcare policy. And they can't if we sign this with bad rules in it. So it's very important to ask some tough questions of USTR about what is going to into this agreement. Finally, a little piece on developing countries. We have a tremendous humanitarian crisis uh, in the developing world, people who cannot access existing medicines. Here, it's at home, it's a leading cause of bankruptcy. In developing countries, it's just purely life and death routinely. Countries will not put medicines on their, on their public programming lists if they can't get them at generic prices. So pharma has actually proposed using an agreement between the US and European Union as leverage against countries like India that provide access to affordable medicines for the developing world to clamp down on those policies and, and wipe it out. And there are potentially many, many lives at stake in that, in that regard. Um, just to, so a couple concluding thoughts. I know that it, I'm sure we're running short. Um, so we, we're to, these agreements are often promoted, particularly in Congress, on the idea that we're going to create a great many jobs and you know, economic growth and so on. And, and tariffs are often cited. Again, tariffs largely non-existent between the US and European Union. This agreement is entirely about which regulations you can dismantle. Um, and that's supposed to be where the where projections of growth come from. And our trade watch division can show you all the reasons that that is a fallacy. Um, but I think it's just important to note that by and large, those, those are the environmental and safety and health regulations that we all care about and work for day to day in this institution here on, here on Capitol Hill. Um, you know, so I think we have to ask some very tough questions about, about those costs. Um, I urge you, well, so there's fast track trade authority. Many of you know this is the mechanism by which uh, the executive can ram these agreements through Congress without much oversight. And we'd like you to fight fast track uh, and retain your authority, your congressional authority, your constitutionally mandated congressional authority to have uh, considerably more oversight over the type of rules that get into this agreement. And before you leave today, if you have a moment to speak with Lee, to speak with us, Stephanie Rosenberg, our congressional liaison. Stephanie, if you raise your hand mm -hmm. back. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, you know, just so, because there is a, there's a caucus developed now to work on these issues, to work on access to medicines and trade informally, but a you know, group of representatives that are talking about it. We'd love to put you in touch with those individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much.